Okay, thank you everybody for coming along tonight. Um, just background to this, about uh, two or three months ago I was asked to give a talk during the uh, Construction Safety Week uh, on behalf of IOSH, um, give a talk at, at, uh, at the CIF uh, on fire prevention of construction sites and in particular um, a UK document, a UK code of practice, a joint code of practice. Um, it's a document I come across from time to time in the course of my work and it, uh, it, it it's, it's favoured, well, it's, the first one is very much a UK document, it's favoured in the UK and uh, by UK insurers. Um, it's not commonly used over here, um, but I, I, the talk starts off with that and I'll then ex move on to other topics. Um, background, just first of all, about myself. Um, I work for Aon. Aon are insurance brokers, risk managers, and a variety of other things. And some of you may have pensions with us. We have actuaries and consultants and so on involved. We're not insurers. I'm an engineer, not a broker. Um, and one of the key things is I'm not allowed to give advice about insurance. So if you see any references to insurance or anything to do uh, with insurance in this, uh, you have to uh, verify it, verify it with, the, with your broker or whatever. It's, it's, um, I'm not allowed by the central bank to give rules about insurance. Um, in Ireland, buildings tend to be built in, in accordance with, um, um, I suppose, mostly technical guidance document B and other building regulations and, um, and building regulation derived documents. Um, also, for example, in hospitals you might find they're, they're, they're built to say HTM or 502 or other documents. A lot of these documents, though, are really, um, they're a minimum standard. Uh, that they, the, the, in the case of TGDB, um, what we're waiting for a new version. There's, 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 a, there's a residential version of that that was issued last year, I think it was. But uh, the, the, we're still, for, for anything that's not residential, we're, we're waiting for uh, a new version, which is being been very much delayed, and it wouldn't surprise me, by the way, Grenfell Tower causes further delays uh, to that. Um, the problem with that, with the TGDB, is it doesn't uh, take into account property loss or property insurer requirements. Um, it, it, it's very much a life safety based document, and it's, 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 uh, it's as I say, quite old and probably at this stage not fit for purpose. Um, property insurer requirements exceed life safety ones. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but that's the way it is. That property insurers, at the end of the day, don't want to write a check. Uh, so they, life safety, uh, sorry, fire safety is all about getting people out of the building, making sure the building doesn't fall on the fireman, maybe not spreading, not fire not spreading, but it, 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 it's, it has different uh, and lesser, um, I suppose, requirements that, than property insurers. And it causes an issue for people like myself involved in the insurance business, uh, particularly when you go to a completed project, go to a finished building and it's built in accordance with building regulations and you find that all of the insurers don't like what was built and it, it, it can create, create issues. Um, the, the UK Joint Code of Practice, uh, there, there's full title there, uh, Protection from Fire Construction Sites and uh, buildings undergoing renovation. It's, um, as you can see, that there are a number of different organizations involved in its production. It does take into account both fire safety and property loss prevention. Um, that's the document itself. Currently, excuse me, it's ninth edition. You can get it, uh, buy it online from the, the FPA. One of the issues with it is that it refers to UK legislation. Excuse me. Um, and one of the problems we have is that UK insurers who are asked to insure contracts in Ireland often ask for it or ins try, to ins try to insist on it uh, being a conditional contract. It doesn't, it doesn't work because the legislation in it doesn't apply in Ireland, but it does contain very good guidance. Uh, uh, there are two versions of it. Um, this, the more expensive one, which is £35 plus VAT, has uh, a checklist at the end, which is good, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The objective, and this is, this is just cut and pasted from, the, from somewhere near the start of the document, the uh, prevention of fire and construction sites on the basis that the majority of fires can be prevented by designing at risk, by taking simple precautions and by adopting safe work practices. In the UK, um, ordinarily contractors are obliged to, to, to uh, on, on, under um, their insurance policy, the, the contractor's always insurance policy to comply with it. And the JC um, form contract, the standard one, normally re um, requires uh, com um, compliance as well. I think it's 6.3, section 6.3 or 6.1. Uh, 
um, refer, refers to that. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the UK uh, legislation doesn't apply. Um, it's considering protection of personnel, contractors and the public. Um, the other thing, yeah, in, in the UK, the checklist at the end of the document is often used by insurers during their audits, their, um, say for example, for a contractor's all risk policy of, of buildings. Um, and again, that checklist contains good and sensible documents. Um, that little comment in red at the end, uh, that's from one of my broker colleagues, that really the spirit of the document should, should be observed rather than the letter of it. Um, this is just the structure of the document itself. By the way, these slides will be put up on the Engineers Ireland website afterwards. I might take out some of the photos, but um, if you, so if you want to get this, these afterwards, I'm not going to read out everything. Um, but again, again, a lot of very relevant things. Uh, um, you know, your, I think it's probably the, the only one actually that had me a little bit mystified was the very last one, sample to, uh, permit to burn waste materials. I don't know if that... Uh, is commonly done on building sites. Uh, I'd say there must be environmental rules uh, that prohibit that. The document itself, um, it's applicable to construction sites, uh, including those where uh, civil engineering works, demolition, alterations, fitting out and renovations, or repair work are carried out, applicable to all parties in the supply chain, including those who specify and design, as well as contractors during the construction. Um, I'll come to it later on, but it tends not to apply to very small contracts. So usually a cut-off, I think, is about two and a half million pounds. One of the key differences between Ireland and the UK is that under um, their fire safety regulatory reform orders, um, you're obliged to carry out risk assessments in, in a way that you aren't here. You, you must risk assess against fire as part of maintaining um, a safe place of work. Um, but the obligations are different in the UK. Um, and in my experience, fire safety identification, risk assessment and control are often weak on construction sites uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, it's uh, particularly smaller sites and smaller contractors. Um, this joint code, it's intended for, uh, uh, inten sorry, uh, it's intended for, 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 um, for, for the client, the designer, UK, the UK equivalent of the PSTS and the PSCS. Um, and again, that last uh, paragraph there, that uh, generally the cutoff is two and a half million. But there's, there's no reason why it couldn't be applied um, to smaller contracts in the UK, um, being sensible of the whole thing, really. Um, the document itself, it's supplementing the UK's um, safe, fire safety and construction work um, document from the UK's health and safety executive, HSG 168, uh, which is another good reference document. If, if you are managing a safe uh, construction project and you wanted to uh, manage fire safety. That's another very good reference document. Again, just uh, sections within the, the, the code itself, uh, and some of these may or may not be terribly relevant depending on the type of project that you're running. Um, for example, ATEX may have limited relevance in, in, in some of the some of the um, some, some projects. Hazardous substances, and I mean I've seen this myself in construction sites, um, resins and, and floor coatings in particular. Uh, is one that, uh, that uh, I've come across. Um, hot work, uh, that's, that's uh, and even on smaller projects, um, uh, hot work is, is, is a common cause of, of fires. Um, need to continually re review risk assessments as hazards change, and this is kind of down to dynamic risk as assessment. Um, temporary buildings, and I've seen an example of that, actually it was a site I was in today, uh, I'd been with them at a, a year beforehand, con contractors working on a site, contractor porta cabins beside this production building that the sums insured in it would be probably, it's for a, a multinational, the sums insured are probably over a billion, and uh, contractor porta cabins with no fire alarm detection and cooking facilities about a metre and a half away from it, so um, that, that's quite a, quite a relevant uh, thing as well. Um, and then of course material storage and combustible waste, uh, and again, particularly if they're, if they're near buildings or plant or whatever. Um, emergency egress covered in the, in the document as well. Um, and responsibility for uh, and the coordination of safety uh, um, and, and, and health work during the construction. Uh, form, having a formal fire safety plan, uh, roles of the responsible person. This is, this is under the UK's um, regulatory reform order. Um, fire marshals, um, and then of course liaison with the emergency services. 
Uh, just, just a few of the sections of the headings out of the UK HSC document, um, fire, fire prevention construction sites, the, the HSG 168. Um, the, so it, these these are just topics or sites, sorry sections within it, and again, it's actually largely a lot of it is duplicating what's in that joint code of practice. Now, uh, this is probably where I'm going to move away from that document because, as I say, it has limited relevance in Ireland. This is a, this document here, on the other hand, um, the the CFPA um, document is. It, this was substantially written by. One of the uh, guys who's involved with the, the, that joint, the, 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 the publisher of, of the UK Joint Code of Practice document, it is very, very similar, except it doesn't refer, refer to, to legislation uh, and is much more applicable in Ireland. You can download this for free. And what, what I've been suggesting to people is that if they use this document uh, as guidance and maybe also use the checklist from the, from the, from the UK's, uh, the FPA's Joint Code of Practice, that uh, that would actually be a very good start, along with risk assessment for, for managing uh, fire safety on site. That document, as I say, you can you can download it for free. You can Google that, and you, you'll find that. Um, just one thing that's uh, interesting: the organisation of the body that that produced that document. Uh, you'll see that, see the, um, the the countries there uh, are Ireland isn't represented. I don't know why, um, but Ireland isn't represented. But that doesn't mean it's not a, a good document. Um, another good information source. FM Global, I don't know if you're familiar with FM Global, but FM Global are a very conservative uh, US insurer. Like they set a high bar, they tend to insure large risks, large, you know, large multinationals. Um, they publish very, very good documents, uh, guidance documents, and there's a link there at the top of the page. But if you just Google FM Global dash sheets, you'll find it. Um, and just by way of example, uh, I have to, how do I do this? Sorry, I need to click this here, I think. Uh, so this is uh, one of their um, documents. I just picked one that was to do with, uh, this is one that was recently updated. Um, so, and it's, so it's quite relevant to this topic, safeguarding torch applied roof installations. Like a lot of, of uh, US based documents is quite codified, but again, very, very good source of, 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 of information. So you can see the, the various headings in that. And uh, again, talking about, for example, I mean, propane cylinders, I mean, that that's, uh, that's mentioned in some of the other documents as well. So just just a, as an example of of, of a of, of a very good source of, of, of information, uh, we'll just go back to this, and I have to go down. A um, bit of practical background: uh, old buildings, oops, old buildings, buildings contain combustible materials, um, or pretty much all. Um, and some uh, forms of construction, particularly quick build or modern methods of construction, include a considerable percentage of, of, of combustible construction. Um, and then, of course, in site, you'll also find combustible packaging and diesel and all sorts of other things as well that burn. Um, site fires, yeah, uh, construction materials uh, suspended, sorry, um, construction timber materials, even in traditional building, include suspended timber floors. Yeah, so the, again, this is an issue, particularly with partly completed buildings, so these things are all exposed. Uh, and that when, before the building is finished, before the plasterboard and the likes go on, there's a much greater exposure um, to, 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 to if, 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 uh, if something is ignited, there's a chance, a much larger chance of a fire. Um, another good document we'll come to now in a moment um, on timber frame buildings uh, prepared by Mitsui Sumitomo uh, on timber frame buildings, and they're, they're particularly vulnerable during construction um, and uh, you can, you can, it, it can, something like that can go to not a 60 very, very quickly. Um, if it's a tall building, th there may be egress uh, issues as well. Uh, if somebody's up at the top of the building and it, uh, it catches fire. Um, other issues, of course, with timber frame buildings is that um, a lot of the tradesmen don't appreciate the issues. Uh, and it could be back at the construction stage in, in terms of, the, say, cavity barriers and fire stopping and these type of things. Um, and then when the building is, is up live and operational, if there's maintenance going on, you can end up with plumbers doing, you know, setting things alight because they just don't realise what's, what's, uh, what the building is actually made out of. And again, I'll, I'll have an, ag an example of that in a few minutes. Um, education training is, is probably, probably something that's quite important there. But one of the others is maybe labelling 
uh, buildings that are of, of this construction. And, and uh, by way of example, you, you come across buildings that have, a, say, a slip brick finish, and behind it, there's maybe uh, there could be a timber frame or something like that. And that's it's, it's quite uh, misleading to, to somebody who's working on, on, on a building like that, maybe carrying out some sort of uh, repair work. Um, just on, uh, with regard to fire protections within the building, ongoing third party independent certification of fire protections is something that, that, that Mitsui have recommended. Um, that's their document. Um, and again, you can download that or just Google it and you'll, you'll find it that way as well. Um, Again, a lot of a lot of good information, good guidance in that. Um, these are some of that they, they some of the considerations that they have raised. Um, proximity of surrounding buildings. This is, this is whether timber frame buildings are even appropriate. <coughs> that um, the nature of the area and arson exposure, number of people likely to be affected by a fire during construction, escape, escape paths, distances, and time. Uh, particular building system to be employed, um, layout of the site, size of the site, um, height of the building and the number of people working within it, Com internal compartmentation, and there might be an awful lot during the construction phase. <coughs> availability, and pr that's actually, this top one here, the availability and price of future insurance is actually, again, something that's quite relevant. Um, and by way of example, if you've got a building with a thatched roof, not many insurers will want to insure it, and those that do will probably charge you a big <coughs> premium for doing it. So th there's an analogy there. Um, final use of the building, this was the suitability. Availability of water supplies and access for firefighting, though I think probably at that stage maybe things are too late. Um, positioning and correct installation of cav cavity barriers, we mentioned that earlier on. Fire resistant eaves, soffits, barge boards. Um, avoid installing electrical fittings and combustible surfaces, and that's something that, again, you, um, I mean, I see myself in the course of, of course of work, not necessarily in timber frame buildings, but in other buildings as well. That electrical devices can often overheat and get scorching and sometimes can lead to a fire. Avoid PV sheets on cavity barriers, avoid combustible insulation, prohibit uh, hot work. Just on, on that, um, second last thing, uh, uh, back probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I, I was I surveyed a building on behalf of an insurer I was working for at the time. I was told that the walls were insulated with rock wool. And a few days later, um, I heard that the contractor had been on site cutting uh, an opening in an external wall for a new door and had ignited the the insulation in the wall, which I'd been told, as I say, was mineral wool or rock wool. And it turned out what it was, it was mineral wool, but it was in plastic bags. So the plastic bags have been ignited. So you, you can get things like that. I'm kind of straying away from timber frames now at this stage, but just uh, you, can, you can get strange, strange constructions and strange things, unexpected things, I suppose. Um, so, I mean, these are kind of common sense, practical fire prevention measures, keeping combustibles away from ignition sources and uh, keeping combustible building elements away from source of ignition or the other way around you. Yeah. Um, minimizing the amount of combustible material in site in as far as possible using non-combustible materials uh, for both construction and temporary coverings. Um, that last one there for anybody who's involved in designing or specifying is, is, is quite uh, quite a good one to, to, to observe. If possible use the light, um, FM Global or Loss Prevention Council or Certification Board, board. Um, approved materials and, and construction systems, um, they're more likely to um, be have, shall we say, a good level of fire protection or resistance or whatever, and also you'll avoid or you're unlikely to have insurance issues or less likely to have insurance issues when the building is, is, is completed. And I'd say again, you would need to talk uh, about the specifics of that to somebody from an insurer if, if you're involved in a project. Um, in general, by the way, if you're involved in a project, it's advisable to run your proposal past your insurer or your broker or somebody, for, for a good broker or an insurer will be able to give you guidance on that. And again, going back to the example that they'll tell you not to put a thatched roof in your building because you'll have difficulty getting insurance. I mean, that's just a kind of an extreme example. Um, common causes of construction site fires. And this, this is from... Uh, again, UK insurers information, this is information I've sourced from UK documents, but um, um, plumbers, hot work, flammable gases, I mean, that's common here as well, roofers, and actually I've got examples of that, welding and grinding, hot work, uh, sparks, by the way, can travel, you know, 35 feet, 40 feet, uh, and can, mightn't actually uh, manifest themselves as a, as a fire for, for, it can be two hours, three hours, um, I've, I've experience of one of our clients uh, 
where hot work wasn't done, being done on a Saturday, and a uh, guy had been grinding, um, but he'd cleaned up and he'd wet surfaces down and so on, thought everything was fine. And he'd one hour fire watch, so he hung around, in other words, for an hour afterwards just to make sure nothing went on fire. He was actually there about an hour and a half afterwards. He was just about to go out the door when the fire erupted, so um, that was from a, a spark and something that had been smouldering. Electrical faults, badly placed hot equipment, and I think the example of that was this in Windsor, the Castle Fire, and a, and a halogen light or something that caused uh, one of the, the, the Queen's um, palaces or whatever to burn down. Arson, and I, I am in the IOSH or CIF talk, uh, I said I didn't, don't think there's an awful lot of arson in Ireland, that it's much more common in the UK, and I was very quickly corrected by somebody from one of the Irish insurance companies that there is, it's just that it's not always recorded or it's not always reported, but it is actually quite common. common. Smoking as well, and smoking construction sites. Um, hot work, as you can see, it's, it's, it's up there at the top. Plumbers, and I mentioned blaming plumbers, roofers are, are devils for it as well. Um, of, often, or traditionally in the past it's been managed by, by, by um, hot work permits but very often risk assessments, formal risk assessment is needed as well, um, hot work permits are not enough. Um, but just one thing that somebody you need to be very careful about if you're involved in anything like this, um, there may be strict conditions on your policy if you're the building owner or on the contractor's policy uh, about uh, <coughs> hot work permits and, and, and uh, that they need to be you need to be familiar with those. So if you're not familiar with those type of things, that's something you need to need to look at. Um, hazardous work must be formally risk assessed and controlled. A hot work permit is not alone is not enough. Yeah. Uh, just examples now, and these are things I've come across. I've a large collection of photographs of things I've seen over the years. This is a medical devices um, factory in the Midlands and uh, somebody was opening a door between two warehouses and you can see where they've burned um, the, the poly polyurethane insulation. Polyurethane insulation is combustible. Um, it's fairly combustible, I suppose that's the best way to describe it. And there's always a danger if it starts burning in between the two layers of metal, as in, in the case of this composite panel, um, that you can end up with, with a fire that's very difficult to put out. Um, so that, that, I think the ideal way that that should have been done is probably with an air grinder, air operated grinder and applying water, that would have been a better way, or cold cutting it if there was some means of cold cutting it. Um, I was talking to, to somebody who was um, t talking to a loss adjuster there a few weeks back, uh, just asking about what was his experience of, of construction fires, and he, he had two recent ones he was able to recount. One was a, <coughs> involving a pub truck restaurant on the second of the house. Pub fire was, was a classic um, case of, of, of a roofer working um, and igniting the felt or maybe the insulation below it, because often you can have maybe a polyurethane or polystyrene insulation. Polystyrene is even is actually considerably more combustible than, than uh, polyurethane. Um, but he didn't have an extinguisher, and he wasn't working under any sort of formal hot work control controls. Um, and that could, well, I don't know the details, because uh, I, I wasn't told, but that could well have created insurance issues both for the contractor and for the, the, the building owner. Um, in the case of the house, a uh, single story extension at the rear of a two story house. The external wall had been external had been externally insulated with poly polystyrene and a render. Um, and I see quite a lot of this going on. Um, and again, polystyrene is combustible. The render is supposed to offer um, a degree of fire resistance. These renders though are very commonly polymers or acrylic materials. They're not they they have some degree of fire resistance, but if there's a, a sufficient heat applied to them or if they're physically damaged and then there's some source of ignition, the polystyrene will, will, will be ignited. Polystyrene melts at a little over 100 degrees centigrade. Um, it gets soft, it melts, and, and it burns very well with horrible black smoke. And by the way, polystyrene is the stuff that was um, one, of the, I suppose one of the key factors in, in the Stardust um, disaster. Um, but anyway, in this case, the, the torch being used for the roof work was allowed to, to focus on the wall, uh, and the wall caught fire, sped up into the soffit and into the attic into the attic space and then the roof burned and collapsed into the house. Um, the contractor probably wasn't aware that the wall was had been insulated because often these uh, rend externally rendered walls or externally insulated walls look like masonry walls. So if you tap them they'll have a hollow sound but they by you know if you look at them um, just by visual inspection 
they often look like they're just that it's that it's a, 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 a cement render, cement based render on on a masonry wall. Um, the giveaway, but usually is that the, the the finish is too good to be true. Um, the, in this case, the homeowners insurance company had not been aware of the external installation. Um, back in two thousand and five, I was working for one of the large American insurers. Uh, I happened to go to Plan Expo, and I came across. Uh, number of types of construction that I wasn't really very familiar with, and this excuse me, this is one of them. Um, uh, it's one of these external insulation systems. Now, if, if you look at the the wall here, um, that grey is a cement block uh, with a, a render material on the outside. The white is a polystyrene material, uh, again with a render on the outside of it. Uh, visually very similar, but they behave very, very differently in, in the event of a fire. And again, the, the policy is a combustible material. And um, by the way, you hear some of these companies using fire retardant polystyrene, but um, I think most insurers would, would, wouldn't, would, would take that with a pinch of salt. Um, and in any case, it melts at a little over 100 degrees centigrade. And if there's a fire anywhere around that, it won't take long for it to start reaching that sort of temperature. And it'll start delaminating and falling apart. Um, it's just a close-up of, the, of the, the construction. So this is one of these modern methods of construction, MMC, that we see at the top of that page. And I have examples of others. This is where you've got a permanent polystyrene shuttering. So you have this grey material is um, a shuttering material made from polystyrene. You have, uh, I can't remember if those little, those, those rods um, are um, steel or plastic, but in any case you, you Fill the cavity there with with uh, with uh, cement uh, or sand cement or concrete or whatever it is, and uh, form an external wall. And again, I'll have an example of that later on. Um, the white material there is what, as far as I know, a polystyrene floor sl slab. Um, this here, it's a polystyrene floor slab. And again, I'll have an example of that later on. Uh, that as far as I can remember, was, was a party wall, or was intended for use as a party wall. Um, the grey material, again, a polystyrene, um, with uh, a rock wall or a mineral wall insulation, and then a gypsum board on the outside. And I don't know how well that would perform as, as, as a party wall. Again, from an insurance point of view, I'd just be concerned about it. Um, again, more of these um, permanent polystyrene shutterings. Um, and again, the thing then that would catch a lot of insurance surveyors in slip bricks on, on I mean, what's behind it is, is not really what you expect it to be. To, to, to be. Um, this, is a, this is a page that it taken out of a diagram taken out of BR 135, and it shows um, a means of fire transmission between floors where there is an external insulation or where there's a combustible exterior in the building. And you can get similar behaving where, where there are potential flues, say, where there's a gap between a cladding material and an inner wall. Um, it's probably the mechanism that was that, that uh, was involved in Grenfell Tower. I mean, I don't, we don't know this for certain, but it's pro probably uh, something similar in Grenfell Tower. Um, that, and again, uh, this is again just an example, and this is showing where you, you have a, a flame traveling up through a, through a, a cavity uh, between an outer and an inner wall there. And again, you can get a flu effect here that, that uh, worsens the things considerably. Just um, this isn't a construction site fire, but it's just a, a, a good example sim similar to Grand Tower. I've been using this, and, and uh, there's an associated video. I've used this before in, in, in talks. Um, and that particular fire went from 0 to 60 very, very quickly. Um, entire face of the building on fire. Uh, well, sorry, I should say the full height of the building of fire, not the entire face. So fortunately, there must have been some sort of um, fire breaks that it didn't spread around the building. And in this case, unfortunately, one lady died, but I think it was of a heart attack rather than from anything directly to do with the, the fire or smoke. Um, that's the front page from that Mitsui document that uh, we saw earlier on. And again, just it's, it's, it's a dramatic photo. just thought I'd better include it. Um, back in... The late noughties, uh, after the crash, uh, we were asked to look at a number of sites, construction sites on behalf of banks, and it was generally safety on the sites and um, 
So I have some photographs from some of them. So that you can you can see the sort of things that uh, the likes of these sort of buildings will be highly vulnerable to 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 uh, to, um, uh, to to arson in particular. Um, and a lot of these buildings, what happened after the crash is guys went in and stripped all the wiring and stripped all the, the, the pipes out of them and so on as well. So there were people in them, breaking into them and doing no good. Um, again, this is another site. There was a security guard present on this site, but it was effectively in a, or largely an abandoned site. And you can see a lot of com combustible material. Um, again, that it would be very vulnerable if something you know, ignited it. That's actually the same site. The uh, the gable that, that these walls, in the wisdom of the architect or the client or somebody, I don't know who it was, they decided to put wicker, as in sticks, on the outside of the wall. Um, just, uh, I, I, it was kind of baffled me at the time, looking at it from an insurance point of view, why they would do that. Um, in more photographs of the same site. This is another ab abandoned site. Um, again, one of these external insulation. Sorry, it's one of these ones where you have the permanent polystyrene shuttering. Um, this one had been abandoned, the builder I think had gone belly up, uh, or the developer had, and um, there was a lot of antisocial behaviour when I went into it, like, there were a lot of needles, of hypodermic needles and stuff like that around, evidence of drinking and so on. Um, you can see where there had been a fire in the building, um, though the polystyrene, the, 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 the amount of da fire damage is a little bit limited on that outside wall which suggests either the fire brigade got to it or else uh, the, the polystyrene had some degree of fire resistance. And uh, that's just an example of one of the walls that was undamaged. So you can see the, the polystyrene insulation and then the concrete in between. And that's, these are just internal photographs from an area that was affected by the, by the, the fire. <coughs> that there, I think, um, is the inside of the wall where we saw the fire damage at the, at the start. Um, and again, that's the sort of stuff at the ground floor level um, that uh, these, this combustible material that's just was just abandoned and left on the site. Incidentally, other things like unprotected edges and dodgy scaffolding, and there are a lot of other things um, that uh, would be of concern. This is just another abandoned site um, down in, well, I better not say where. Um, and again, just the port of cabin, the arch, container, I should say, on the outside of the building, and timber with nails and timber of course can be easily ignited. Um, back yeah, around about 2005 I was doing a bit of work in a, in a Midlands town and the guys that I, in, the, in the place I was visiting were telling about these houses that were just up the road from them um, and they were saying they were built out of a polystyrene. Remember I showed you a photograph earlier on of a polystyrene floor slab? I think that probably goes with this type of construction here. Um, but these buildings are um, substantially of polystyrene construction. I'm talking about the, the walls, the intermediate floor, um, the the chimney. I think is a fake. I hope it's a, I hope it's a fake. Um, and this is a duplex uh, that uh, is under construction. Um, and you can see the stairs there. And we'll zoom in now on the stairs, and you'll just get a better look there. So again, the white polystyrene material. They have a uh, wire mesh over it, and in this case, I think it's a cement based render they're putting on the outside. Now, I'm not positive about that, but it, it, it appeared to be a cement based render on the outside of it. Um, that's more of it and more of the polystyrene, and again, very nice scaffolding as well. Um, I should say this site, I don't know if the, I don't know what actually had happened to the builder. I, I just walked onto the site, there was nobody there, no site security, nobody any, anywhere around. It was, I think, about four o'clock in, in the afternoon. Um, those are the uh, polystyrene intermediate floor slabs that I mentioned. So these are used between the the the, the duplex apartment uh, on the ground floor, sorry, the, the, the ground floor apartment and the, the two story unit above. Um, and there they are in place. That's taken the inside of one of the ground floor apartments. <coughs> and you can see the grey is um, our galvanised rails uh, that are giving it a bit of additional structural support. I think it's additional structural support. I'm guessing that's what it is. And uh, you then have the timber battens onto which the, the gypsum, the plasterboard, would be fixed. And again, if you had an electrical fire or any sort of a problem or with lighting, and I see, you see the lighting wires there, the whole thing is very susceptible to, 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 uh, to, to fire damage. Uh, and again, just some of the upper walls, you can see again the same construction and also the, the lovely scaffolding. That's them today, or well, that's from Google Earth, uh, Google Street View. I'm 90, sorry, I'm 99% sure that's the same buildings, the same, same development. Um, 
and the duplexes. And I think the photographs we saw were inside some of those there. Um, so I don't, I, I think if there was a fire in one of those, uh, you know, it grew in any sort of a way at all, and um, you could end up with, with melting polystyrene, and goodness knows what happened. I don't think, I, I don't think you'd want to stay put policy in if there was a fire in, in one of those. Um, just putting the whole thing in, in, in perspective, and I hope you're not going to be cross with me for this, but it's not, fire in terms of construction safety is not, is not the big one. And this is, these are UK statistics, um, falls from a height. I, and actually, there was, there was something on some of the, in the Irish media recently about similar statistics, but this is, it says, from, from a, a UK Wilson Alliance document. Um, falls from a height and work at a height 45%, slip strips and falls then, excavation collapse, electrical asphyxiation, vehicle impact, health and hygiene, manual handling, and a variety of others. And fire is right down at the very bottom of the list in terms of, of um, health and safety. It's mainly, fire is mainly a property and business interruption issue on construction sites, including delayed startup, as in your, your, if you're building a factory that it won't be able to deliver until later than intended. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope that was of interest. <laughs> any questions? We have some roving microphones, if there are any questions there. I don't know who's in charge of them. Our secretary. Hmm? Our secretary. Your secretary, if we could find the secretary, <laughs> who's conveniently buried himself. Well, both the, the, the construction and the design phase, there, there, there's, there's a role to be played. But going back to what I said at the very, very start, an awful lot of stuff is built according to minimum standards. And um, also then maybe there's a lack of awareness as well. Um, lack of awareness of issues. And I, I mean, I'd personally like to see... But the contractor's project supervisor yeah. on bigger, larger yeah. projects has a... That's all within his remit. It is, but I, my experience is that, particularly in smaller sites, it's not as well managed as it should be. And again, the, there's this need for formal risk assessment, which yeah. often isn't done. Um, mm. the, or poly, it's not. the polystyrene, like uh, shuttering or formwork, that was part of spec constructions mm. in the noughties, I think, I'm not mm. sure, even the 90s, you know, where the polystyrene would form the... Uh, shuttering. Yeah. Well, the first time I came across it was 2005. Now, maybe it had that been around pink, before that. pink development in the Midlands or yellow primrose or... Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I, I, I still think I'd want to buy one of those houses myself. <laughs> Personally, I wouldn't like to buy Yeah, but I myself. think in a lot of those cases, like, you know, there's, okay, it would it be f exposed in the finished product? It shouldn't be, but it then if you get be. a fire in, in a room and there's any sort of damage to the plasterboard, or I mean through a ceiling rose or anything mm. like that, uh, you, there's an exposure. I looked at a particular project now with that um, type of formwork in an apartment complex, and uh, basically, um, like the formwork is left in situ, like the polystyrene mm. formwork is left in situ. Mm. But uh, looking at it, none of the formwork uh, kind of crossed any compartmentation. Mm. In other words, each apartment, even if it did go, it mm. wouldn't spread beyond the apartment. And then it was covered like with plasterboard and uh, okay. Okay. on it. So yeah. it was relatively but okay. If there's sufficient heat, though, polystyrene will melt. It'll... it'll form pool fire and can spread. Now that's kind of in fairly extreme but circumstances. But it couldn't because all the jointing okay. details okay. were like, it okay. wasn't running through yeah. anywhere, so. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. But again, it loses its strength once. And I mean, it, I don't think it would take terribly long if there, a, if there was a developed fire in that room, it wouldn't take terribly long for, for you to reach, a, and for the polystyrene to reach uh, 100 degrees. Not at all, once it gets into and it. The, and then the whole thing starts falling apart. At least that's what I would expect would happen. I presume your premiums would be higher anyway on uh, some of these houses where, you know, the protection is pro uh, uh, provided I I externally. 
I think that's a question for a broker, but what I would say is Like the extension you showed there, yeah. you know. That yeah, we see that if the insurance company was aware of it. They, that, that's the oh. thing, they may not have been aware, and yeah. I think a lot of homeowners, a lot of building owners aren't aware of the issues. Um, another example is back when I was working for that, that uh, insurance company, I was asked to go out and have a look at a, at a mixed development premises, um, which included retail offices and apartments, and it had been described to the bro to the ins to the insurance underwriter as being um, described by the by the broker in question um, as being of standard construction. And standard construction in insurance terms means like your three bed semi, you've got masonry walls, you've got maybe a bit of say suspended timber floors and uh, maybe a timber frame roof. That's, so they get there's a mix, and that's what the insurance underwriter would have been expecting to, 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 to underwrite as a risk and it turned out to be one of these external insulation systems of polystyrene and his response straight away was that his reinsurance arrangements because insurers generally will reinsure a lot of their, 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 their the, the, the risk that they talk, take on that it just didn't cover it and uh, gave the broker uh, in question either 24 or 48 hours to find another insurer um, but the other thing is that and of course that, that broker will then have to declare that the, the risk has been refused by, by this particular insurer, uh, which may make selling the risk to another insurer more difficult. Uh, the other thing is if a fire had occurred, there's a good chance it wouldn't have been paid because it was different to what was described. So, um, and I'd say that's actually quite a common thing. I think there are probably a lot of buildings that are inc inaccurately described to the by, the, by the owners or maybe by the brokers to the insurers. I don't know, I, I, I'm speculating here. Um, so again, if any of you are involved in anything like that, uh, make sure it's accurately described. Um, and then the other thing, um, and this goes... your own domestic policy. Well, that's a, probably a good place to start. And your car policy, by the way, as well. Uh, just read what, because uh, there could be conditions on it. Um, yeah, and actually, that's the point. Uh, uh, any An insurance policy is a contract, and if you are in breach of a term on the contract, then the, then the contract's not going to deliver. And... Um, Often you find there are policies on, uh, or conditions on contracts that just uh, people are, are, are unaware of or because they haven't read them or um, uh, aren't observing them for whatever reason. Well, Kevin, in terms of site inspections, is it the broker or the insurer who actually visits the site? And if when they do, on what basis do they risk assess or cherry pick which sites to visit? It can be, can be either. Um, generally, insurers, if they have a program, um, say if it's a large company, uh, um, say, but, um, I don't want to mention it. So suppose you have a large hotel chain, for example. Um, you might find that the insurance company will visit sites based on the sums insured, the ones that have the highest property and business interruption sums insured. They might also select some that say are seen to have say particular risk, like a flood risk if they're beside a river or something like that. Um, the that's how insurers generally do it. The broker is acting on behalf of the client, on behalf of the owner of the, the business, so they might be steering them in a different direction, um, but of course they have to be fully upfront with the, with the, uh, with the insurer. Um, but they may have different reasons for directing them in another direction. And then the other thing is, of course, brokers may survey buildings, but again, for, for or properties or in whatever, for, diff um, for marketing purposes, maybe to, and this is one of the things I tend to do a bit with my, with my job, is I, I visit client companies' businesses and effectively survey them and prepare a report that describes the risk accurately to, um, so that our brokers can get accurate quotations from insurance underwriters. And again, that's commonly based on the same criteria, sums insured, the higher sums insured, and, uh, and maybe um, if there are particular risks that need to be flagged if you're as I say, beside a, if you're on a floodplain or something like that and then of course the risk ma management strategy that's in place the plans the emergency plans and so on that are in place I was thinking specifically in relation to building sites as opposed to finished operating factories or houses or, or, or such like when you are insuring the, the contractor or all this on the, on, the, on the building site do you, do you visit or do you, how I, do you I, tend not to but um, yes it does happen I'm on one in the UK uh, in uh, in December uh, where um, again, a large hotel uh, under, uh, undergoing work and uh, I have to visit that site uh, with the the insurers yes the insurance surveys are done on larger risks for uh, on behalf of the the insurers the contra contractors all risk insurer all right. Aspect or at least from, solely from a property protection 
It can be both, and generally when on a construction project, the business continuity is often a delayed startup. Um, if um, th that's a particular type of cover um, that that can be bought, um, so it, ca it can be can be either. And in some cases, as in the case of the places that, are, that I'm visiting in the UK, that they also have existing businesses closely in close proximity, so they could also be affected, though that might not necessarily be the same insurer that's that's exposed there. Would they supply you with a method statement con continually or plans on what's going on? It would generally be the, the insurer's surveyor or engineer. Sometimes they're engineers, sometimes they call themselves engineers and they're not really, um, or, or, or surveyors. Um, they, they, it, it varies. Okay. It varies. Um, it depends on, on how thorough they are. Um, they would... Uh, they, yes, that they, they, they could also be. In, they, they'll be interested in, in I suppose, anything that's got potentially lead to a property loss, and uh, then they're interested in systems of work that were things that, that I suppose, uh, are likely to lead to loss and prevent a loss, and then mitigations as well. The things that would reduce likely or shall we say the severity of a loss. For example, uh, it might be emergency plans, um, fire protections. Here, you know, uh, there are fire hoses available or this type of thing. And they run them past you first, and then. Gen generally, it would be the insurer, the insurer's okay. surveyor, rather than than uh, than ourselves. Sometimes, yes, um, where the likes of um, uh, some of the large brokers have people like myself employed, and we can advise the client on how to build things and how to do things in a way that doesn't create difficulty for, with their insurance or won't. For example, and again, going back to the example, we'll advise people not to put a thatched roof in their building. I mean, I'm taking a really sort of obviously uh, extreme example, but um, uh, we can advise people on fire protections and, and uh, construction systems and that type of thing. And we do that for our, our larger clients. It's part of the service that uh, some of the larger brokers can, can provide. Any questions? Yes? Sure. No? Yeah? yeah. Much of the guidance you talked about seemed to be directed at the contents of a building after it's finished as opposed to during construction. Um, the contents of a building? Uh, well, let's, let's say the insurance is the finished building and in operation and whatever the finished product might be. Very often a building might well be millions, but mm -hmm. the contents could be billions. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And the, the, the two insurance risks and the uh, financial implications mm -hmm. of them Yes, and you'll, um, you'll, yes, I, I think I can only agree with you, um, and I, 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 can, I, I just I can only agree with you, you're there, you're, you're dead right. Um, and maybe the other thing that would go hand in hand with that is that if you have, particularly with industrial sites where you have a partial loss, where you have a small fire, you can end up with, uh, a, I'll give you an example, client, multinational client uh, with a factory in France had um, a fire in the electrical room, main electrical room, and all, also in the transformer room, there was an issue, I think, with with uh, fire doors or something between the two. The fire spread further than it should have, and then there was a delay, I think, about calling the fire brigade as well. There was some sort of communication problem with the with the the, the gatehouse. But the the long and the short of it is that the property damage, and these are just figures from the top of my head, was maybe about five million. But the business interruption because the factory was closed down for seven months was over fifty million. So. Um, you know, these are the sort of things that, that can happen. I, I, mean, I can think of other examples like that, and again, roughly 10 times the business interruption is 10 times the, the property damage. These are large industrial sites. And the precautions that take place during, say, the, 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 <coughs> the project we're talking about in terms of the hotel, the hotel is occupied mm. and they're ascending it, really. Mm. Um, Sort of precautions that they put in place. Yeah, yeah, just very good plans. Um, uh, and in that the, the, that particular, they, they, they've a few projects on, but they're just very, very well managed, and they have to be. Okay. And heat detection, and the likes of yeah, yes, and, and training and procedures and inspections and monitoring a whole load of different things. Yeah, uh, and maintaining physical fire protections as well as in um, you know. So at what stage is a property required to 
to advise their insurers, for example, if an extension is happening? Like during I, I, before the, the work would start or else the work starter, do they look for the insurance cover after the extension? I, 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 oh, I'd really prefer to stay away from any detailed insurance stuff because anything I say about insurance, you really do need to verify it with, with a broker. Um, in practice, some companies will approach us and ask the, the firm that I work for to advise them and it'll be done right from a, a very early stage and that tends to happen with large multinationals and larger firms uh, and then there are others you go out to the site maybe chaperoning one of the insurers insurance surveyors just making ask to make sure that they're not asking for things to be gold plated or whatever and uh, you find that some major changes happen that that, uh, that we weren't aware of um, but if there's a change to the sums insured or change to the, to the, to the, the risk that's on the insurer's books, they really do need to, to be advised about it. Um, but again, yeah, this, is, this is something that really you need to discuss with a broker or somebody who's got the right insurance qualifications. I think at the end of the day, if you're involved in anything to do with insurance, read the, read the document, read the policy, read the conditions, read everything because um, from time to time, it, it, it's not quite so common now, but there was a time when I used to go out to um, visit a client site and find that they were in breach of very important conditions that could affect whether they would be paid. And what often used to happen is somebody, maybe a financial controller or somebody gets the insurance documents in, doesn't read them, puts them in a folder or files them or whatever, it doesn't uh, give the, the relevant bits to the engineering manager, the facilities manager or whoever it is. So. Um, things an example I can think of um, often there are warranties on policies where there's commercial cooking that if you've got say a deep fat fryer that you have to clean the air extract duct maybe every six months or every year and it's it's, it's often the form of a warranty which if you're in breach of it will avoid the policy and I've come across sites where that um, where they haven't been cleaning they've been in breach of the warranty which then means that my broking colleagues have to try and square that with the insurer and get the insurer to stay on cover. Um, or maintaining fire protections, uh, maybe if you have sprinklers. I can think of one insurance company that used to have a condition in the policy, a warranty in the policy about maintaining the sprinklers in accordance with the, the LPC rules or whatever it was, and uh, going out to a client site and them not doing it. You know, So, I mean, straight away their policy is actually void. It might as well not have a policy. So. But again, you need to talk to a broker about anything like that if you have any, any queries. One other question there. Um, much of what you're talking about assumes there is an insurer in place yep. for a building. Many speculative type developments would not have an insurer in, in, in view. I mean, that terrace of houses that you showed, for mm. example, they could end up with one, one insurer or an individual insurer for each individual house mm. and they may not necessarily all have the same view on matters. Mm. Yeah. What should they, the developer do in that circumstance? Um, the, there are, for example, the UK's Loss Prevention Council um, and the UK's Fire Protection Association, they publish documents. Um, um, the UK's FPA is probably the best a good source because most UK insurers will follow any guidelines that they have. Um, so, if you're following their guidelines, UK insurers and most other insurers will actually be okay with what you're doing. Um, so that, that that again, I didn't refer to that, um, but the UK's the UK FPA and I've forgotten that I think it's Risk Authority is the name of the sort of sister organisation that publishes a lot of these documents. Um, and membership isn't dear to, to access those. It might be a hundred or two hundred a year or something like that. Um, but that, if you if you follow their guidance, you will avoid a lot of difficulty. Um, but again, I have to keep going back to saying you, you do need to verify anything like that with 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 your with a, with a broker or an insurer. Any more questions? Well, thank you for coming along. Thank you. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you.